Many years ago, I started a technology company called Rolling Thunder Technologies. At this point, I had worked for Amazon.com, PepsiCo, and as an investment banker on Wall Street. I was living in the heart of Silicon Valley, and I knew plenty of people in the technology industry and in venture capital. My startup was aimed at automating the audit processes within large companies, an area I knew a lot about, my sweet spot. So I put together a detailed business plan, identifying the market opportunity and the unique approach I would take to automating the audit process and how, step by step, I would penetrate the market. All signs on the compass pointed to success. As I told my wife, I was an experienced, knowledgeable, connected executive. Now, I don't remember this, but she claims I might have said this more than once. <laughs> and then, I failed. My startup was an utter, total, complete failure. And I felt ashamed, and I felt lonely. And ever since then, I have been deeply interested in the question of what is it that causes some to succeed, while others fail. Take Trulia, where I worked most recently. Trulia is the real estate website you go to when you're thinking about buying or selling a home. It was started by two young European entrepreneurs. Pete Flint was a physics student from the UK, and Sami Inkonen was also a physicist from Finland. The two of them met when they came to the US in the fall of 2005 to start the MBA program at Stanford University. The first year, they lived on campus in student housing, but at the end of the first year, they were required to move off campus and find a place of their own. And they said, this is going to be easy. It's 2005, it's the US, we will go online, and in no time flat, we'll be done. And instead, what they found horrified them. And based upon that experience, they started Trulia. And today, more than 50 million people use Trulia each month. They eventually took their company public and recently sold their company for two and a half billion dollars. Why is it? Why is it that a company like Trulia was not started instead by an experienced, knowledgeable, connected executive <laughs> from a Remax or a Century 21? Um, why was it started instead by a couple of 30-year-olds with no background in real estate who had barely been in the US for 12 months? How about Lyft? You might have seen their ride-sharing cars with a pink mustache in the front. With the press of a button, they will connect you with a friendly background check driver. The trip costs less than a taxi, and instead of hassling with cash, you pay through your phone. Lyft was started by Logan Green and John Zimmer when they were in their 20s. John had worked for a couple of years in investment banking, but for Logan, Lyft was and is the only job he's ever had. And today, Lyft is uh, available in 60 cities across the country, and millions of people are using Lyft to get from point A to point B. John and Logan recently raised a $500 million round, valuing their company at $2.5 billion. Why is it? Why is it that a company like Lyft was not started instead by an experienced, knowledgeable, connected executive from a Hertz or an Avis or an Alamo? Why was Lyft started by a couple of 20-year-olds with little experience in the transportation industry? Trulia and Lyft are not isolated examples. Everywhere I turn in Silicon Valley, I see this pattern over and over again. Look at Airbnb. Two, uh, three young design school students that are shaking up the hospitality industry. Square and Stripe, two companies that are upending the payments industry, both with founders that had no prior experience in the payments industry or Evan Spiegel and Bobby Murphy, who started Snapchat while undergrads at Stanford and are redefining how young people communicate with each other. There's something going on here, isn't it? There's something going on. What is it about these young entrepreneurs that sets them apart? What is it that drives their success? Over the last 10 years, I've had the opportunity to work alongside and observe some of these entrepreneurs, and what I found surprised me, and it may surprise you. I found that their success is driven not by the traditional principles of 
market definition, uh, product strategies or marketing programs, nor is it driven by how hard they work or how smart they are. Yes, those things matter. But what really matters, what really matters are three simple behaviors. Three behaviors that these entrepreneurs share that set them apart and drive their success. The first behavior I found surprised me the most. Let's call it naivete. These entrepreneurs are using their limited experiences, they're not knowing the lack of knowledge as the weapon to change the world around them. While many of us may find ourselves embarrassed in situations where we don't know answers to questions or try and hide a lack of knowledge, these entrepreneurs do exactly the opposite. They use the naivete that, to ask questions that leads them to rethink the world around them. Logan Green was 22 years old when he graduated from UC Santa Barbara and he took a trip to Zimbabwe. And what he saw there fascinated him. To start with, not many people could afford a car. The government was in disarray, inflation was over 1,000%, there was no public transit to speak of, and yet in this chaos he saw that every seat, in every car, in every bus, on every motorcycle, on every scooter, was occupied. People had figured out the popular routes and in a grassroots way were sharing the resources available to them. When he got back home, he was confronted with the reality of his hometown of LA, in that just about everyone owned a car, and in just about every car, there was one person. One car, one person, three empty seats. There are six million registered cars in LA County. With four seats in every car, that's 24 million seats in a city of eight million adults. That's a lot of empty seats. And he asked the question, why? Why do you need to own a car? And of course, immediately he got back some very rational, thoughtful answers. Well, safety. It's not safe to let a stranger into your car. And convenience. It's too much of a hassle to go out of your way to pick up another passenger. But John and Logan did not stop there. They used their naivete to keep asking these questions and formed a company called Zimride that later became Lyft. And they're solving these objections using technology. Take the safety objection, for example, that it's not safe to let a stranger into your car. Now, when you open up the Lyft app, you will immediately see information about the person you're picking up. You can see their profile, their photo, their ratings, and if you have friends in common. And this creates an immediate level of trust. Or take the convenience objection that is too much of a hassle to go out of your way to pick up another passenger. John and Logan recently invented a service called Lyft Line, and it works like this. So I live in the North Beach section of San Francisco, and I work in Soma. When a Lyft driver picks me up, in North Beach and we start driving towards Soma, Lyft will match us up with another passenger that's going in the same direction at the same time such that we'll make a 60 second stop in, so in Chinatown, pick up that passenger on our way to Soma. Now, one car, three people. Fewer cars, less emissions. And oh, by the way, it was cheaper for me in that I paid half of the trip that I ordinarily would because I shared it with another passenger. And it's a social experience in that I invariably end up striking a conversation and strangers become known. Their limited experiences, their lack of knowledge, their naivete, is the weapon that John and Logan are using to change the world around them. The second behavior is urgency. These entrepreneurs are getting stuff done today. Not tomorrow, not the day after. It's often messy, it's almost always imperfect, but they bring a sense of urgency to their work and to those around them. I saw this in Pete Flint at Trulia. Shortly before our IPO, we were working on the launch of one of the biggest products in the company's history. It was a product called Trulia Mobile Ads, which we intended to sell to real estate agents so they could advertise themselves and get in front of home buyers that were using Trulia on mobile devices. As the launch date neared, it was clear to me that there was a lot of work left to be done. So I went to Pete and I said, hey, look, we have to push the launch date back by four months and answer these questions. We have to do more research and figure out uh, things like how might the sales of this new product cannibalize the sales of our existing product. And Pete said to me, Sean, 
we have to go now. Failure today is better than success tomorrow. I said, Pete, what does that mean? Failure today is better than success tomorrow. And he said, Sean, look, what I mean is this. By getting the product into market today, we will start learning. We may hit, not hit the mark and you know, we may stumble, but we will iterate and reiterate such that by the time four months come around, we will have a much stronger product in the market than if we wait, do more research, and try and launch a perfect product. Failure today is better than success tomorrow. I'll contrast Pete's approach with a very different experience I had when I was working at uh, eBay. This was in 2005, and eBay was largely an auction house in that you went to eBay, you bid on an item competing against other bidders, and at the end of the week, the auction closed, and maybe you won the item and maybe you didn't. Our competitor, Amazon, was coming on strong with a different model, which was fixed price. You went to Amazon, the price was known, you bought the item, and Amazon would pick, pack, and ship it to you. So we started work inside eBay on a project called eBay Express. And as the name suggests, this was a service designed to be more similar to Amazon's fixed price. We spent over 16 months finessing eBay Express with a team of 80 people and a small army of consultants and researchers. And we spent over $100 million ideating, strategizing, researching, testing. And when we eventually got eBay Express into market, it bombed. Now, the problem with that failure, the problem was that instead of iterating to get the product right, everyone just walked away. And people walked away because the cost of failure had become too high. There was so much money, time, and effort that had been invested in eBay Express that it was seen as a major disaster inside the company, and nobody wanted anything more to do with it. Contrast that with Pete's approach where he's getting stuff done today. He's embracing the messiness. He's iterating and reiterating. He brings urgency to his work and to those around him. Failure today is better than success tomorrow. The third behavior is perhaps the most powerful. Obsession. These entrepreneurs are obsessively focused on an idea that drives their thinking. Now, we all have goals and interests and ideals and interests that we're working towards. What's different about these entrepreneurs is that they're obsessively focused on a single thing, a clear, single-minded focus that drives their thinking and actions day and night. Let's go back to Lyft for a moment. John and Logan are obsessed with improving the health of the planet. And they want to do this by reducing the number of cars on the road and reducing emissions. This is their thing their single thing, their obsession. Now, things did not always go so well for John and Logan. As I told you, they started out with a company called Zimride that later became Lyft. It was in 2010, and Zimride had not found wide consumer adoption, and money was starting to run out. And I remember one evening after I'd finished up my work at PayPal, I drove over to Palo Alto to see them. At this point, they were living in a one-bedroom apartment on Waverly Street where they'd sleep at night and then get up early in the morning and fix up the apartment before the five engineers arrived, and then the work would start in the living room. That was the operation back then. That evening, as John Logan and I sat in the kitchen over pizza and beers, we discussed the tough situation that they were facing. And I, as the knowledgeable, connected, experienced executive, said to them, hey, why don't you go after a different idea? Social gaming is taking off, Zynga is the darling. Why don't you take the money that's left in the bank of the five engineers and go do something in social gaming and you'll find success more quickly? The next day, John and Logan called me in in a quiet but firm voice. They said, Sean, we're not going to do that. I said, why not? And they said, because what we really care about is improving the health of the planet. Fewer cars, less emissions, that's our thing. And this obsession, this single-minded obsession, took them through the ups and downs of the following years, and now they're finding tremendous success with Lyft, with millions of users. And an increasing number of Lyft users are starting to ask themselves the question, hey, with Lyft around, do I really need to own a car anymore? 
This is John and Logan's thing. Their single thing. Their obsession. So I leave you with these three behaviors. Be naive, act urgently, get obsessed. Be naive. There are a gazillion things in this world we don't know about. What are you going to choose to be naive about and then use your naivete to change the world around you? Act urgently. Imagine getting something done today, something that you've been working on, perfecting, shaping, crafting, and embracing the messiness along the way. Because failure today is better than success tomorrow. Get obsessed from your smorgasbord of ideas and goals and interests and pursuits. What's going to be your thing? Your one thing, your obsession. Be naive, act urgently, get obsessed. Thank you.